Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1769. March is Women's Month here on Cars Yeah, and we're celebrating women in the automotive sector by having 23 inspiring automotive enthusiasts throughout the month. These are all women who are shifting the conversation. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today, I'm back in Los Angeles at one of my favorite places, the Peterson Automotive Museum, with a very special guest by the name of Laura Fisher. Laura, welcome to Cars Yeah. Are you ready to put it in gear and release the clutch? Absolutely. Let's go. All right. We'll have some fun. Now, before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing you might share with us today that most people don't know about you? Something I've kind of realized recently, a lot of people think I've been doing maybe interviews and public speaking for a long time. I seem to come off well. This is completely new to me. Only the last year has my role really blown up. I've gotten a lot of notoriety at the museum, so still very introverted and shy. So this is all new to me. <laughs> well, you know, I always say going outside of your comfort zone is how you how we grow and how we become better. And the more you do it, the better you become. So uh, I have no doubt you will be one of my superstars today <laughs> in this uh, fun month of celebrating women in the automotive sector. So let me give you a proper introduction, and we're going to dive into how you land in such a wonderful place, getting to combine your history and your love of history with cars. So here we go. Laura Fisher is the Peterson Automotive Museum's archivist. She started her career in uh, public history as an archaeologist and a historian. She completed her undergraduate education at Cal Poly Pomona and received her master's in history from Cal State Northridge. Having participated in nearly every aspect of public history, from excavation to curation, she uses her varied experiences to serve the museum and the community. As the archivist for the Peterson, Laura describes her job as taking care of everything that is not a car, very interesting, and acts as a conservator, librarian, archivist, and special collections caretaker for this magnificent museum. As a passionate public historian, Laura advocates for increased public accessibility to history and supports museums as tools for social bonding and as an expression of community identity. We'll be back in just a minute to talk with Laura, but first a word from our sponsor. So sit tight, keep your seatbelts on. We're at the Peterson today. This is going to be fun. Our pets are part of the family, but they can be very hard on your vehicle's interiors. Do you have a pet in your household that loves to go for rides? Covercraft offers a wide variety of solutions to protect your vehicle's interior from Fido's rough treatment. Canine cargo area covers are padded for comfort and provide door-to-door -door protection. Pet pads have built-in features and keep cargo areas and your seats protected. Covercraft's quality pet solutions cover cargo areas, bucket or bench seats, and protect from damaging claws, pet fur and hair, mud, moisture, and drool from permanently damaging your vehicle's interior surfaces. Choose from a variety of styles and covers for almost every vehicle made. And I've got a deal for you. Cars Yeah listeners are going to get 10% off if you use the code YAH21, that's Y-E-A-H-21, Simply use the code YAH21 at checkout at Covercraft.com. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. American Collectors Insurance, that's how I now protect my Porsche Turbo. The one I call my Orange Crush. Are you insuring your classic vehicles on your regular daily driver auto policy? Then your special vehicles are at risk. Your regular auto insurance carrier won't tell you how much you'll get until after a claim, and more than likely, you'll be in for a rude awakening. With a agreed value policy from American Collectors Insurance, you'll be paid your vehicle's full agreed value. No surprises. If you're driving your collector car less than 5,000 miles a year, do what I did. Call American Collectors Insurance and get your very own agreed value policy tailored to your specific vehicle. If you're like me, you're picky about who works on your special ride. A great policy allows you to choose your repair shop of choice, and that means 
you'll know the job is done right. I shopped around and decided to protect my car with American Collectors Insurance. They've been protecting vehicles since 1976. Give them a call for a quote today at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. And protect the ones you love. I did at American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. All right, Laura, we are back. So let's go a little deeper into the corner here and have you share more about what you're doing at the Peterson, what it's all about, what your role really is there. It's a nice way to get the tires spinning a little bit here on Cars Yeah. So, Laura, take the wheel. Oh, my goodness. When I think about my job, I think, what don't we do in regards to special collections? Like you said in the intro, we take care of everything that's not a car in my department. And that means rare books, documents, artwork, car parts, extra body panels from cars. <laughs> Who knows what comes my way? Uh, we take care of a photography vault, motion picture film vault, a library, a 3D artifact vault, and, you know, unpublished material, a periodical collection. Anything in the museum's collection that's not a car, that's us. Wow. So a lot of history, a lot of different types of material. And in addition to that, we also contribute to exhibitions. So whenever there's material in an exhibition that needs to be mounted or displayed or chosen, um, we help with that. We take care of galleries. Any artifact that comes in on display, we care for throughout its display time. A lot, a lot going on at the Peterson in our small little archives department. <laughs> well, not so small, really, when you think about this. When I think of what you do, I think of the automobilia that we as car people like to collect, all the other little things around it. And you go to some of these people's garages or collections and the car is just the big centerpiece, but it's everything that surrounds it, all these little knickknacks and things. But that's really the important part of the history of these automobiles. I mean, the things you're caring for are so vital to support this big vehicle. And I have a great picture of you with, it looks like a component of old Yeller. Yes. That's on, you're going to be on your show notes page in the Cars yeah website. You can check it out. What on earth are you doing there? <laughs> well, we just filmed, I, we, the museum started a YouTube series, uh, unboxing the archives. I kind of joked with our marketing team of, you know, I've got lots of boxes to unbox on YouTube. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so they said, that's great. And, you know, with the pandemic, we've been looking for ways to reach out to our viewers and followers. And so they decided to start this series. And so we filmed Women's History Month this last week. And I'm actually standing in an extra body piece for the Belchowski Yol Yeller. And that is Mark III. And um, we have the car in the vault. And a reason I pulled it out was because I was telling the story about Max Belchowski's wife, Ina who actually helped him engineer, design, and upkeep all of the the race cars. And, you know, these are the cars that would go on to be driven by, you know, Carol Shelby, Dan Gurney. These are famous cars. And his wife was behind it almost every single one. And she grew up, actually, her dad was a mechanic. And so she grew up in his auto repair shop. So when she met Max, she was no stranger to cars. So I was trying to tell the story of how this seems like just an extra piece of, you know, a race car we have, but there's a story behind it. And that's really what, when you were mentioning automobilia, these objects help us tell the story of how automobiles are integrated into our lives, the history of them. How did they affect us? You know, automobiles are, historians call this a micro narrative. It's a way of looking at history through a certain perspective. And cars are just one way to do that. And we, you know, we do that at the Peterson all the time. And so all of those kind of supporting characters that I take care of are really important to telling that story because they help flesh out the story of what a car means to us besides just getting around or it looks pretty or it goes fast. Absolutely. I, you know, who comes to mind when you share that story is Bertha Benz and yes. really the first woman to take a road trip. The first road trip on the planet was by a woman who borrowed her husband's car. And I didn't realize when I studied that more how integral she was in his life of helping that car become a viable object for people to buy. She helped work on the brake lining. She helped sell the first car. But the fact that she also made the first fuel stop when there were no fuel stations and figured out how to do it. 
So I always say, you know, some people have this saying that behind every great man is a great woman. I say next to every great man is a great woman because in my life, my wife has played such an important part in my success in my life, supporting me, helping me, giving me great guidance because she's way smarter than I have. My listeners have heard that many times and she is. She's way smarter than me. So it's a wonderful story. And I didn't know that about old Yaller. I knew about it because I used to raise finished cars. So that's an interesting story behind the picture that you'll see on the, on Laura's cars. Yeah. Yes. Show you'll see page. me putting on my, uh, my, my gloves too, that I use to handle archival material. Um, yeah. if people watch the first episode, there's a funny moment the editors left in where I, I always have trouble getting the gloves on, they're, <laughs> you know, so they wanted to take a funny picture of me putting the gloves on. But yeah, and, and I have wonderful archival images of Ina in the pits helping working on Old Yeller and she's in her cute little 1950s crop pants and her little headband and everything. And it's just it's just perfect representation of, you know, women getting in there and doing what needs to be done. So. Where can people see this video? Is it on the Peterson Museum website? Yeah, it's on our YouTube page. Um, they can go to the Peterson Automotive Museum YouTube page and we have the first episode up. We're planning another one and then they want to do, I'm also filming this week, smaller features that show me doing conservation. Wow. Um, so I'll be re- repairing some paper on Friday and they'll be filming that. So those are supposed to meant to be three to five minute videos um, showing what we do behind the scenes. And that's going to be actually in my workshop downstairs near the vault though. So do you ever think when you landed this position, you'd be a YouTube host? No, no. I, I swear off, you know, the public face. I don't have social media. I, you know, I'm the nerd in the basement with the books. (laughs) Not anymore. (laughs) Not Not anymore. anymore. Yeah. So, um, but I am grateful to the museum for having so much faith in me and, um, they have been really good about showcasing a lot of the people who are the core staff of the museum. Important. Uh, so yeah. it, it's been fun and interesting, certainly pushing my, challenging my comfort level, things like that, but it's been fun. It's all good stuff. Well, you're doing a magnificent job. So, uh, there you go. Step out of your comfort zone. That's what we always say. That's where the good things start to happen. Uh, Laura, would you share your driving inspirations, uh, perhaps a key mentor in your life, someone who's helped guide you and given you a lot of support? Uh, Who is that person and how did they help you? Well, besides the boilerplate, your family and all of that, I have wonderful people in my life who have always been there for me, for my family. But if we're speaking from a career perspective, I would have to say it was a lot of my undergraduate and graduate advisors, particularly, I, I won't say her name, but she's the po- she's the public history advisor at Cal State Northridge. Um, she really took me under her wing. Uh, you know, uh, when students are at their most vulnerable, they've decided to go to graduate school for history, which is, <laughs> you know, I always joke, I, I got a graduate degree in history because for the money. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's it's the passion. People that do what you do are so passionate about preserving history. And it's so important to preserve history, not only for future generations when we're all long gone, uh, but to do it in a very uh, respectful way. So whether that history is good or bad really doesn't matter. It paints a window of time that you're preserving for people so that 100 years from now, somebody can go, these weird things that people actually got in those and drove them? Really? Are you kidding me? I mean, yeah. I just summoned my car and it shows up and it takes me somewhere. I wouldn't even yeah, be flying right now. We'll be in SpaceX rockets going. Somewhere right. Yeah. We'll be on our way to Mars. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> join Elon for one of his talks. Right. <laughs> no, for sure. I mean, that there's a lot that goes into and, you know, that's what that mentor taught me was to always kind of fall back on that passion when you feel things are not going your way to be very tenacious. Because at the end of the day, what I do, I do for very specific reasons, because I believe so much in public history and museums and what collections and preservation can do. I believe in there's a huge responsibility in looking at the past and being a historian or an archivist. How how do we contextualize history? How do we teach it, you know, ethically? And um, I mean, I know in 2021, we're talking a lot about that. And so my field has been a big part of that. And I certainly see the field changing in some ways, probably for the better. And so it's a huge responsibility. And it's there's a lot of passion that goes into it because at the core, you believe in what 
this job can do for humanity. I know that sounds kind of grandiose or trite, but I understand. it is true. It at is the end true. of the day. Yeah, it really is. When you think of the the automobile did something that I don't know that anything has done since. It made us mobile. And, and here's a great perspective I've shared on this story before, on this show before. And that is, you think about the food we eat. Even 50, 60 years ago, most of the food we ate came from within a certain distance because it couldn't be kept cold, couldn't be kept fresh. Now, I said it before, my blueberries were from Chile. My banana this morning was from Ecuador. My lunch could be from Europe. And tonight, my fish I'm having for dinner maybe was caught three days ago in the North Atlantic. I, amazing. And all of this has to get to us. And it comes on a motorized vehicle for the most part. Even if it's flown in, a vehicle has to pick it up and take it to a distribution center and get it to that store so that you and I can go in that store and grab it. That is isn't tremendous. But also you think about... Henry Ford making it possible for us all to be mobile and start to, I can go anywhere. I can drive west and get a new life. And none of this was quite possible before the automobile. And in the history of mankind, the car's not really been around for very long, has it? No, not when you, when you think of the context of history and, you know, human history, how far back we have evidence of human activity and things like that. Automobile as we know, it feels like a bit of a blip. And and we know, you know, as technology progresses, it progresses exponentially. You know, we have more advancement in the last 50 years than we did in the last 500. It's just, just how human progression seems to go. And so certainly it's the automobile has become vital to a lot of, well, for an America quality of life, like you mentioned and stuff like that. And I often think about other places where they may not have as much accessibility to transportation like that. You know, they don't have the privilege of getting blueberries from Chile and things right, like that. Right. So it does, looking at those contrasts helps us understand how vital transportation has become and maybe perhaps what kind of infrastructures we need to change in certain areas to help increase quality of life across the globe. And so, and you can only do that by looking at automotive, automotive history and, you right. know, transportation history. And so learning from those patterns and how can we improve going forward? Absolutely. So. How would you advise women who want to get into a part of the career field in the automotive sector that you've gotten into? How would you advise them to approach that or dive into that? Because your history comes to your history. Isn't that interesting? Your history comes from another part of being an archivist, and now you're in the automotive sector. So if a young woman loves cars but loves history, what kind of uh, advice would you offer? Oh, well, I do have a very unique job where I get to blend conservation history, archival science, research, all the things I love about museums I get to do. And I, I did that by... <laughs> being very, um, having a very short attention span and doing a lot of different things. <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> no, I, I, I started in archaeology. Well, actually, I started in astrophysics. <laughs> As Wait a minute. Okay. And we're going back yeah. to Mars now. Astrophysics. Yeah, Holy cow. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, when I was a, a little kid, I always loved museums and archaeology. And I have memories being eight years old telling my dad I wanted to work for a museum and bring back mummies to the museum. <laughs> That's cool. Because I didn't understand how museums worked, but that was actually quite unethical to go steal mummies. From <laughs> yeah. Place. I'm going to go borrow some mummies and bring them to the museum. Exactly. So, but, um, and then my mom's an artist and my dad's a scientist. And I had this really interesting blend um, cognitively. And then I, you know, from a very young age, also wanted to go into astrophysics. And I really started in astrophysics at Cal Poly. And then I kind of had this coming to moment where I was like, uh Oh, I think I actually really love archaeology, too. I, I kind of said I can't let it I couldn't let it go. You know how something kind of nags you? that mummy kept talking to you over the shoulder. <laughs> exactly. And so I, I, I signed up for an archaeology class my first uh, quarter, just for fun. And I, I came home to my dad and I said, Oh, Oh, <laughs> uh -oh. I'm changing. <laughs> yeah. And I happen to actually end up at one of the only schools that has a CRM or cultural resource management degree option in archaeology. There are a couple others, but I was very almost you know destined to end up there. So I switched majors. Never. I still love 
you know, science and the idea of the scientific method. And I apply it every single day to my job. And so I very lucky I get to use both worlds. Um, but then I, ethically, I felt I couldn't be an archaeologist without also being a historian because mm. I started working in the Near East. I, I, I did a, a excavation in the Near East and I also worked in the Mojave. And so I was like, well, I need to have a basis of history behind this. So I did that as well. And I did a double major. And then I started going all over the place with different research projects and different opportunities. And before I knew it, I had this huge variegated like cache of experiences that I had to figure out how to streamline and mold and kind of market when I ended up right. on the job market. And so what I can say from that is my advice is maybe perhaps don't be as haphazard as I was, <laughs> <laughs> but don't say no to things that scare you. Try new things. I always tell interns, this especially women, don't be afraid to try to learn something you don't know. I think women, especially young women, are under a lot of pressure to prove themselves sometimes. I've certainly felt that pressure. And it's not necessarily conscious. It, it's not conscious in the people you work with that they're putting that pressure on you. But mm -hmm. sometimes there is that extra eye on you, that you know, extra turn in someone's voice of questioning you. And you really do start to internalize that. And so we can feel like we can't say we don't know or we're afraid of saying we want to learn something new. Like someone's going to say, you you weren't born knowing how to do that. No, <laughs> nobody, nobody's born knowing how to do any of the things that, right. you know, I do at my job. So take new experiences. Don't be afraid of them. You know, vary your experiences uh, if you can. And if an opportunity comes up that wasn't quite what you were thinking it would be, try to learn from it if you can. Um, and if you're absolutely miserable in it, just remember all things end eventually. <laughs> yes. Great advice. A lot of wisdom there. You dropped a whole bunch of golden nuggets, nuggets on us today. I think that's fantastic. I'll remind my regular listeners, I've had some really great talks with people from the Peterson, including Terry Cargus, who's been on several times, the executive director there, Michael Bodell, uh, the deputy director, who actually I got to visit the Peterson uh, in 2019. He took me on a drive in, a, I think it was a 1932 automobile around the, the streets of LA. That was interesting. Uh, the traffic in LA and a car that's that old. And of course, Leslie Kendall, who I've known forever, chief historian. You work with some really fabulous people. For you I listeners, do. you can find all those shows on the Cars Yeah website. What's the favorite part? Do you have a favorite part of what you do every day? I always say I let, my favorite part is that it's never the same. Ah. I take care of a lot in regards to the size of the collection, you know, for how many just two people taking care of as much stuff as we do. And on that same flip side, though, I never have to do the same thing every day if I don't want to. <laughs> and that's exciting because in academia, when you're, you know, first pursuing a museum career, they kind of ask you to choose. Do you want to work in exhibitions? Do you want to work in conservation? They want you to kind of stay in your lane. And a lot of museums are like that. The Peterson and some smaller museums our size perhaps are a little different. And I kind of like that. I'm I'm so excited that I didn't have to choose all the things I love about museums. I get to do every day. Exhibits, conservation, uh, I you know, working on our library, helping curatorial research. It's all of the things I love to do and all the things I train for all in one place. And so it can be a lot sometimes, but also I'm very grateful it's not boring. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You've figured out the secret sauce to a very happy career. Let's take a short break. We come back. I'm going to ask you what I like to call the challenge question, something that maybe has pushed you a little bit harder than you maybe like to be pushed. So keep the seatbelts on. We're at the Great Peterson Museum today with Laura Fisher. We'll be right back. Crash jewelry is handmade from the metal of luxury cars while preserving the original factory paint. Founder Christy Shimfke came up with the idea when she moved her jewelry studio into her husband's Los Angeles auto body shop. After watching beautiful Porsche ultraviolet fenders and Ferrari Rosso Corsa hoods head to the scrapyard, she developed her own unique upcycling process of cutting, bending, and sanding the metal into unique wearable pieces of beautiful automotive art. For Women's History Month here on Cars Yeah, 
Crash Jewelry is giving away a special Ferrari Art Deco cuff. The cuff includes an empowering message engraved inside. Enter to win today by subscribing at CrashJewelry.com. Plus, Christy is offering Cars yeah listeners 10% off in March when you use the code Cars yeah at checkout. That's CrashJewelry.com and use the code Cars yeah today. And don't forget to follow Christy on Instagram at Crash Jewelry. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on first-hand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, Smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions. Ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. Join Linkage. Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Hey, and don't forget, you can get $10 off your Linkage subscription if you use the code CARS, yeah. Go to linkagemag.com today. All right, we are back. So let's talk about a huge obstacle that you face in your career or your life. It doesn't matter. What matters more is what it taught you and how you moved past that situation in a positive way. So take us on your own journey here, Laura. Gosh, I always think when I think about kind of the biggest obstacle in my career life would have to be right after graduating um, grad school. Here I am with a master's in history and the world is obsessed with people who have MBAs and finance degrees. And I have this very kind of specific way I like to work. And, and, you know, I felt like there was really no place for me and, and the jobs that are out there or the paths that are out there are so highly competitive. So I felt overwhelmed by, will I ever make it? Will I ever find any, I got to the point where I was like, I'll just take a job at an accounting firm because, (laughs) because I worked in accounting to put myself through grad school. And I was like, I guess I always have that to fall back on. But, um, that particular period, right after graduating, uh, with my master's moving back home and, um, my family was going through a lot of personal grief and, some a lot a lot going on I just was like will I ever be able to have even the energy or motivation to even try and so that was put very hard but the one thing I do say about it what it taught me was that there is a path in some way or form you can't be afraid to just kind of figure it out and I always thought there would be this kind of formula that you have to figure out that you have to do all the right things and I figured out that it's not really actually a formula. You have to kind of make your own way and take your own opportunities. Kind of what I was speaking about earlier, where it's like, don't be afraid. So, you know, you have to take a few chances. And that's actually how I ended up at the Peterson. I, I needed a job, but there's not a lot going on for history <laughs> graduate. And I took kind of an education position at the Peterson. It was part time until this particular position opened up a few months later. And it was complete happenstance. And I remember talking to my dad when I was offered the job at the Pearson for the, the part-time position. I said, should I do it or should I go get the job that offered me benefits and, right. you know, yeah. a salary? And he told me something I'll never forget. He said, you're young enough to not make money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got time ahead of you. Yeah, he kept telling me, he said, I always had you girls, my, me, my sister and our family to take care of my both my parents worked very hard both of them to, to take care of us but they had us younger about the age when I graduated school and so he said you don't have any of that go do it he told me to do it yeah and I did and a few months later I ended up with the my dream job so there you go it worked, it worked out so what you think may not go your way may actually build into something bigger you know and if it doesn't you move on you you find a new path 
but I got very lucky and, and things worked out. Well, you have a very wise father. So, uh, and, his, <laughs> yeah. and, and you're wise to take his advice too, which sometimes people don't, they go the safe route versus the bolder yeah. route and the bold route almost always takes you to places you can't even imagine. So yeah. again, great story there. What's a, a bucket list item perhaps, and I'm sure you have many bucket lists. You're still a very young woman. <laughs> that you want to accomplish in life moving ahead is there a big hairy audacious goal as they say and good to great <laughs> uh that you're looking forward to oh it's so funny well besides all of the career stuff i want to do for the museum i still want to get us we haven't really had a professional archive until our renovation in 2015 so and i've been there for the museum four years so i want to get them a fully functioning archive research library. And we're still a little ways off of that, but we're, we made huge strides in the last few years with huge grants and endowments and all kinds of amazing little projects that we've completed. It, it's pretty fun. So I would like to continue doing that kind of work. I, I always have this kind of personal connection to places I work or projects where I'm not done with you yet. You know, <laughs> I, I, I I couldn't leave the Peterson because I'm not done with you yet. There's so much I want to do there and I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I didn't get it done. So, uh, yes. But personally, and it's funny because if you asked me that four or five years ago, I would have said, get my PhD. I mean, I, that's the next step. Get my PhD. And that's kind of what I mentioned where you think there's a formula. You think there's certain things that you have to do to get the career you want. And I saw I had to get my PhD, but then I said, and I was still applying for PhD programs my first year into working uh, at the museum. And then I thought, why am I doing this? I got the job I would have wanted after I finished my PhD. Why are you doing this to yourself? Right, right. <laughs> and so I actually let go of that. And so that's kind of a lesson in your bucket list can change. And then I realized what I really wanted to do with a PhD was produce some academic work on the things that I love to research and write about. And I said, why can't I do that anyway? So I think my other bucket list item would be to produce an academic work of some kind. I'm really fascinated as an archivist about micro narratives, like I said, where seemingly everyday objects can tell a story. You know, they look like um, small objects to us. Like my thesis uh, was about postage stamps, right? Postage <laughs> stamps. Know, I was, yes, I told the whole story of Germany's hyperinflation oh. uh, after World War One through postage stamps. And so I love that idea that as something we kind of look over every day can tell a story can tell you know give us a historical perspective and right. so i would love to write a micro narrative like that about the objects that i work with every day maybe tie it into you know museum my museum work and museum theory and things like that but, very cool and yeah. i have no doubt you will do just that <laughs> Very cool. Hopefully. It's yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, of course it is. All good things are. What's uh, perhaps a positive way that you found you've been able to help others enjoy and get into the automotive world? Um, I don't know about get into, but in terms of getting giving back and helping those in the automotive world, I think about this a lot, two particular things about my job is um, we take you know, archival donations, objects. And you speak about the automobilia that people have and collect. And some of it is quite historically significant and people don't even realize it or they do and they don't know what to do with it. And probably once or twice a week, I get a call from either kids who have a father who's or, or mother sometimes who's passing or very old and they don't know what to do with all this stuff. Right. Is it, is it significant? They don't know what to do with it. They don't want to just throw it away because it's so important to who their parent was. And so I walk them through and see if we can take any of it, if it's historically significant enough to go in our archive. And so we can preserve it. Or I try to help them find other places that it can go instead of the dumpster or right. Goodwill. Right. And so that is important to me because while I you know, I preserve artifacts of the museum, people are preserving history in their own way when they collect these things. And I want to help them feel good about leaving that behind. And then sometimes I get calls from the guys themselves and say, I'm, I'm going to go in a couple of years. Like, what do I, I do with all stuff. this? Yeah. yeah my do family do doesn't want it. Yeah. And it's very sobering and, and, uh, a lot of, uh, it's very humbling to talk to these people and the peace they have with life and, you know, some life lessons you can learn from older people that right. I 
I have a contact with. And then the other thing I like to do is these guys also reach out to me and they find, um, we have a digitization project that we completed, mm-hmm. archive.peterson.org. And um, we're still working on a lot of the website function of it, but they are able to search the object, the images. And these guys find images of themselves or them with their dads or their dad's car that their dad built. Wow. And they, re- they reach out to me and they say, I want to know more about this photo. That's me. And that's the little kid in that picture is me. Yeah. Uh, that's my dad. That's my dad's car. And that is really exciting to me. That's putting history in the hands of the public and building that connection with history. And that's what you have to do. A lot of people say they hate history and it's boring and stuff like that. When you find that personal connection with people, you'd be surprised how obsessed they can become with certain parts of history. And, and so that's always great. That's right. always great. Yeah. Well, the challenge with, that I see with history when I think back to the schooling is they just touch on a very top layer. It's like going to an archival dig and looking down and going, oh, it's just <laughs> dirt. And they walk away and they don't work through the layers. And that's because school has to teach you so much and they don't have the time. But I think of uh, in college, I had an art hist- or a U.S. history teacher that taught it in a way I'd never heard it before. And it opened my eyes to history that I never was very interested in. So a lot of it is digging deeper, to use a, a, a pun here, for being yeah. an archaeologist. Is there a, one big high point so far that stands out for you in your life, something that you're really proud of? I would say in the last year, the archive has gotten a lot of attention, and we've gotten a lot of grants and a lot of good things happening for it. And that's really been a high point for me is – seeing kind of the first couple years of building up the archive and all the projects we had going on and being kind of unsure of some of my steps where I was, you know, everyone feels that where they're like, am I going the right trajectory? Will this work out? Am I making a huge mistake? Am I mismanaging this project? But things seem to have fall, fell, they fell in line over time. And the museum was very supportive of a lot of things. And so this last year has just kind of been seeing all of the recognition and the opportunities that the archive is getting kind of roll in one after another. It took like that first start took a lot of work. But then eventually, you know, things just kind of started layering and happening. So that's kind of been the high point. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we'll be right back. Another quick note from a sponsor here. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about what I like to call the ultimate drive. So keep your seatbelt on. We'll be right back. Here at Cars Yeah, it's all about inspiration. And our charity of choice is Tech Force Foundation, where it's all about making a positive difference in young people's lives. Tech Force helps young adults discover their talents and passions for all things automotive with a mission of helping students develop a career as a professional technician. TechForce awards nearly $2 million in scholarships every year for students to pursue technical education, and they support hands-on activities, events, and mentorships across the country, working to change the outdated perceptions of these careers. Autotechs are in high demand, but the supply of qualified technicians is critically short. They need your help to fuel their mission. Learn more and join me in supporting them at techforce.org. All right, Laura. Now, if I could wave a magic wand and arrange for you to go on a drive, a very special drive, with a very special person in a very special automobile, what would the automobile be? Who would the person be who'd be driving this vehicle? And maybe a question you'd ask this person, what would that be? Um, I'm afraid I have a very human answer for you to that. Well, we're all humans. I know. If I could do one last drive, it would be with my grandmother, oh, my nice. maternal grandmother, who um, she practically helped raise me. We lived very close to her, and I was always with hers. And so she passed in 2016, right after I graduated from grad school. So she never really got to see any of my career take off, and she was always so supportive of me. And so the reason I say a drive is because when I was 18 and I got my license, we had all been taking care of her for so long, taking her to appointments or grocery shopping. And when I got my license, I could finally help. And it was so exciting to me. And it was really special to me to be a part of helping her and just being with her. And we go back to that, you know, what do 
cars provide. They provide mobility and freedom. And that's what that did. And so I would probably just take her for one last, you know, drive to go get, it sounds silly, but to go get groceries and no, no, <laughs> just it's... talk to her. Right. Get her some lunch and it would probably be in my my mom's old Scion because that's what I drove. <laughs> and I'd probably just ask her if uh, if she can, if I could see her one more time, just ask her if she knows I, I made it. Everything's okay. Like, <laughs> I think she knows. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, let me twist the question a little bit. If you could take any vehicle out of the museum and take her for a ride in that vehicle, <laughs> which vehicle would it be? I would have to say because she would love this, it would be our, our Chevy Bel Air ah. convertible just because I have a funny story of her when she was younger. She had a few fun nights in a in old cars like that yeah. Um, yeah. So with old oh, friends. Wouldn't that so. be fun? Nice thought. She would love that. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, no doubt she's looking down and shining uh, and very proud of what you've become. How about a book, Laura? Is there a book you've read that you could share with us that you found very helpful, insightful? Sure. So actually recently, very apropos of Women's History Month, um, I just finished Madeline, one of Madeline Albright's memoirs. It's called Hell and Other Destinations. <laughs> and it was very, she's first female secretary of state. And I think what I really picked up from the book, you know, I'm not a politician, but a lot of lessons about humility and diplomacy that I think people can apply in, in any field. Um, she's very candid about the things she didn't know, the missteps she was making. And this particular memoir is about her later years after she was no longer Secretary of State, all the work she did afterwards. And for her to be, for lack of a better term, so far in life, but still admitting to the things she doesn't know or the things she's unsure of and, and the mistakes she's making was very helpful to me, especially as a, you know, a career woman to know that we're all kind of always winging it and figuring it out. Yeah. And that's very comforting, I think, for a lot of people, especially women in their careers. Fantastic. First time that book's been recommended. I'll remind my listeners, you can go to the resources tab on the Cars yeah website and find guest recommended books. It's over 1800 books listed there. Uh, check it out. It's very, very cool. All right, Laura, you know, you've taken us on a wonderful ride today, and I can't thank you for enough for spending some time with me today and sharing, especially during Women's History Month, which is so fantastic. Perfectly apropos for Laura being a woman in on Cars yeah, during Women's History Month. That's pretty darn cool. Before you drive off into the sunset in uh, with your grandmother, let's paint that wonderful yeah. picture in that, uh, that old Bel Air. What's one little thing you might offer our listeners as part of a, a bit of guidance or wisdom? I like to tell a lot of people this. It's very simple. I tell a lot of people to stay curious and keep learning for as long as you can. Yeah, oh. it's pretty simple. Very important thing to do <laughs> in life. And you know what? If you visit the Peterson when they reopen, and they will, or go online right now if you can't get there right now and enjoy the plethora of information that they've done. I tell you, during COVID, you guys did some tremendous things to include all of us. I was invited to uh, many Cars and Coffees and did some videos I presented to you guys, which was really fun for me, something I'd never done before, a virtual Cars and Coffee with my toy car. So thank you for what you guys have done. What are the many ways people can learn more about the Peterson Museum? Oh, so you can visit our website, peterson.org. We also are on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, oh, pretty much any social media outlet, Peterson Automotive Museum. Yeah, we've been producing a lot of educational material, a lot of tours, um, videos, things like that. I got looped into it now. Uh, yep, so. you're a part of the show. <laughs> I do. I am. And it's, it's it's going to be fun. So, and I think a lot of these things will still continue after we open up as well in some way, shape or form. And, you know, huge shout out to every department that's really put together their resources from our education department who does amazing work, our curatorial department, just a lot of stuff going on. Um, and a lot, I mean, every single department, the museum from facilities to security, they're all integral to what we do. And we can't do these public facing programs without all of these people supporting us. So I think it's always important to look at museums as holistic institutions with a lot of different people supporting the work that they do for the public. Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you uh, what all the folks at the Peterson have done have reinvented themselves during this very crazy pandemic time we've dealt with, and you've done it in a magnificent way. So listeners, again, check out the Peterson. When you get to Los Angeles, you have to go visit this museum. Say hello to all the folks there and have a wonderful day. But in the meantime, go online and check everything out. Laura, 
Thanks for being so generous today with your time and your expertise and sharing your stories with us, our YouTube star today. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you either down the road or at the Peterson Automotive Museum. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun. This is really a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.